everybody. Mike Griffith here. Welcome to tonight's Angle on the Beat. And uh, I'm really excited because tonight I got a really special guest. Uh, I got the middle linebacker for UGA. Well, I mean, I guess it's former middle linebacker. I always feel weird calling them former Bulldogs because they're really Bulldogs for life. And I don't call them ex-Bulldogs because that makes it sound like they got voted out of the club. But I guess I would say departing Georgia middle linebacker, Monty Rice, Monty, I really appreciate you joining us tonight, man. Taking a minute out. How you been? I've been good. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. I appreciate that. You know, I got to tell you, right after football games, Monty's in the moment. I mean, he's in the moment. They usually have like a 10-minute cooling off, maybe a 20-minute cooling off. I don't know. Monty, how long does it take you to cool off? Because you are one intense dude, really. Yeah, so it really just depends on the, how the game went, how I think I, uh, we play or how I play. But, yeah, I just, and then I'd be having a shower, too, because, you know, got to keep your hygiene up. So i just be having to, like, process process everything that just happened. So that's my main thing is just, you know, getting my headspace right. One of my favorite Monty Rice stories, and, and, and there's a lot of legacy games for Monty, but I think my favorite one was when Georgia beat Auburn uh, down on the Plains, uh, 2019, Auburn was favored. And, and listen, that 2019 team, Monty, I don't think it's going to get enough credit. Uh, a top five team, things didn't go perfect. You lost all your receivers. Guys were hurt at receiver all year. Jake was doing what he could. Uh, but that team was – that was a one, that was one gritty team. That was a team that went to the, the Sugar Bowl uh, short of players and beat Baylor. But the game I remember was beating Auburn, a team that was supposed to beat you, Georgia went into that game, had not given up a rushing touchdown all year long. And they beat Auburn with the – I'm trying to think. I think it was Trayvon Walker gets Bo Nix on the last drive. Everybody's celebrating. Sack. Monty comes in there seeing red. There's smoke coming out of his ears, man. I'm like, Monty's like, God dang, that guy got it. I said, Monty, what? He's like, that Bo Nix got in the end zone. I mean, that streak, talk about that. It still gets you. Look, you're still upset. You're still mad yeah, about that. Yeah, and it was my fault, too, because uh, I, ain't, I ain't surfing. You know, he, he had to get, like, one yard. All he had to do was stick the ball across the um, the pylon and he scored. But, yeah, I just didn't, you know, come tight enough. and I, Or, actually, I got too wide, and he just cut back and, and dove and scored. And, you know, they kind of about sparked the comeback and, you know, just – we didn't back up our offense enough, you know, even though they weren't playing well in that game in the second half, we could have put out the fire more. And, you know, kind of in the second half, Auburn kind of turns into like a, a different team. It's like they attributes went up, but we were able to get the W, and that's what matters. You know Auburn, our little brothers. Yeah, well, you know, uh, as I recall, I think you had them shut out for three quarters. I, I think that's backing the offense up pretty good myself, but – you know, it is Gus Malzahn. He is a you – know, let me let me ask you this, because I've asked Kirby about it. You played Gus for three years. And the first time I, I talked to Kirby about it, he said, you know, Gus is a guy you try to survive the first quarter, and then you kind of figure out, is that – now, last now the, obviously, the last season he had that other dude call and plays, and that was a mistake. But was Auburn a little – was there always just a little twist? What was it about Malzahn that made him such a good offensive coach, you think? Because, like, um, he can trick you, and if you don't know like what you're looking at, he can make it look like something is not and, and get you and, and beat you. And that's the thing about playing Auburn. Like you know, they're gonna have good players. They in the SEC too, but they try to like trick you. They can't. They they didn't like. They never really tried to beat us straight up, except my freshman year when they had that real good offensive line and Carry On Johnson. They was just trying to trick you by doing unbalanced formations, all these motions, and it's just. You know, you just got to have real good ideas when playing against them. But Mazan does a good job of making stuff look like something that is not. Like, I swear there was a couple of plays in that 2019 game where I had – I thought I had good eyes, and it looked like the right thing, but it wasn't the right thing. And could have been a touchdown. But, you know, that's just how it goes sometimes in the moment of the game. You know, we're not going to be perfect. They're not going to be perfect. They're going to miss some assignments too. So the good thing about Auburn is you can't let them get big plays and you just got to keep making – like any offense, you got to keep making them snap the ball because if you keep making them snap the ball long, long, long drives, they'll mess it up offenses all they do. They say uh, wrong alignment, missed assignment. That's what they say about you backers. 
you know, and, and when you talk about eyes and we hear Kirby talk about eyes and I know that, you know, we got to have, there's guys in the secondary, they got to get their stuff right, but you're controlling that front seven alignment. Communication is big. And, and, and I know it's very kind. I know Kirby runs an NFL style of offense. It's obviously going to increase your draft stock quite a bit that you played in an NFL scheme, but can you give us, an example of like a, a, a read, like what's Monty Rice looking at and what needs to happen for certain defensive fronts. If you can break it down with a really elementary lesson for us all in middle linebacker eyes and reads and alignment, give me an idea like what your job is when the auto breaks, and you got to play call. So, so coach land is going to, uh, I won't give away our signals on here. Cause we'll give away the signals. No, they love us. Offenses love to steal signals. So I ain't going to give away our signal, but let's say we got, um, let's say we got a coverage call. I ain't gonna say the coverage either, cause then right. I'll pick up on that. Coverage but. A, coverage A, yeah, and, coverage A, coverage A. So, so boom, we got coverage A call. I'm gonna tell the front A, tight left, tight left. That sets the that sets the uh, like Devontae, Jordan Davis, all those guys. That tells them how to line up based on the direction we say, and then you know, based off what coverage A is, it's a number usually that tells the DBs how they're supposed to play. And um, also the, the number that's connected with the coverage, it tells us linebackers where we need to drop or whether we need to play man or play zone or match it. And based off how we set the front with the tight call or whatever, that tells us, hey, if you say tight left this way, the linebacker has this A gap or that B gap. So um, just basically like, um, like if we say a coverage or a defense, the first word is usually the front. The second word is usually the coverage or the, um, or like the stunt we may be running. So, um, it, but it's all packaged in like one, um, like one call or whatever. And you just understand that. So, so during the week, you guys are going over it. If they do this, we do this. If they do that, we do that. And then all of a sudden movement happens. The tight end gets up and resets in the fullback. Now you got to start talking all over. You got to reset the front when that, every time there's movement, right? Yeah, exactly. So we do. We would have to reset the front, but the offense also has to wait for their guys to be set because you can't have two guys in motion. That's flat. So they also have to kind of wait a little bit, not too much, but um, yeah. So boom, ball snap. Um, if the guard pulls, we follow it, um, and you you can read that. You can usually look at the lineman's hand, like you know. People like, you know, Saul and um, Justin Schaefer and them, they, you know, when it's a run, their hands, like, really in the ground, like, making an imprint right. in the ground. Right. When it's a pass, you know, they're kind of they're kind of light. Like, they're back, you know, they're getting light on their feet. So, it's always good to, you know, key that. Or if you got a guy that's kind of, like, stiff on the offensive line, it's hard for them to hide those kind of things the bigger they are. So, that always can speed up your um, your mental process as far as, like, knowing whether it's a pass or a run. Tremendous amount of reads going on for Monty uh, from, you know, reading the, you know, reading the offense to putting Georgia in the right call to reading the offensive linemen and their sets. Monty, I always used to like, you were a former running back. I used to always like to look at the depth of the running back. Those guys seem to want to line up one yard deeper when they're going to carry and a little bit closer when they're going to pass pro. Uh, so I, I know that you, you've got, and all this is happening. And the reason I bring this up, and people are going, well, Mike, there's linebackers that do this all over the place. Well, there are. But, you know, in 2019, uh, Georgia led the nation in the fewest explosive plays over 40 yards. You weren't breaking a play. Georgia, the great thing about the Georgia defense, these guys are assignment sound. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of gap integrity. And, Monty, I'll, that, as far as from what I know, everybody's responsible for a gap. And as long as everybody does their job, there's a wall. There's no gaps available because everybody's filling these holes as Monty's orchestrating this call and making sure that all the gaps are covered. You leave one gap open, and we talked about the Peach Bowl and it was because uh, there was a certain play call that took a player out of position. There was still some other opportunities, though, Monty says. And without getting any details, Monty, Kirby's got the, such a great defensive mind. It's like it's like a plane crash. It, it's a lot of stuff got to go wrong to have a big run, right? Yeah, like, you know, if I ain't about to point nobody out, I ain't never did right, that. Right, but, right. Um, yeah, on that long run, it's not that 
Cincinnati did anything spectacular. You know what I mean? It's not a run we ain't seen before, but like, you know, we had a missed tackle, you know, usually at is at a big run like that, there's something wrong at every level of the defense. So right. maybe something went wrong on the defensive line. Maybe someone got reached or maybe at linebacker, we didn't see it. Like you just, you know, maybe our corners didn't get off the block fast enough to pre- prevent a long run or, you know, so there's multiple things that went wrong on that play. And, you know, Cincinnati was able to exploit that. That's kudos to them. Well, Cincinnati was lucky Monty Rice wasn't playing. They were lucky that they were lucky that the foot wasn't, wasn't a hundred, at least, you know, maybe, the thing of it is, and, and I talked with Eric Stokes about it, it wasn't really a bowl game. It wasn't – there wasn't a trip. And, you know, the bowl game is one last hurrah with, uh, with, the bro- with your brothers, with your teammates, uh, and experience. And it just wasn't like that. And in your case, in Eric's case too, you know, a, a professional decision had to be made. The last thing you want to see – is a guy that goes and plays in a bowl game and gets injured. And I already know if, if that was a playoff game, I, you, nobody's nobody's holding you out of it, right? Like DeAndre Walker, like they had to put they had to wrestle him off the field, you know, a couple of years ago against Alabama. But I, I know that had. I mean, how tough was it though for you, a guy that's you know, you're the warrior in the middle? I just can't imagine, you know, once you woke up and turned the TV on, what was going through your mind, man? Well, first off, I woke up late. Um, on the game day, like I, uh, I just woke up late, and then I check my phone, and everybody's saying we losing. You know, I'm getting a little usual uh, smack talk from people. You know, saying it's my fault. But anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, Georgia fans. But anyways, um, yeah, um, it was definitely hard to watch. You know, I definitely want to be out there because, air. You know, everybody on that team I, you know, went to war with before. I worked hard with them, bled with them cry with them, you know. So, you know, I definitely wanted to be there for my teammates, but I just had to, you know, look like towards the long run and see like what was the best decision. Well, and also, and I saw this happen with Al Wilson at Tennessee in 98, they won a national title. I mean, this was a guy that had a, a shoulder in and out. You had a foot. I don't know how you manage this all year long. Some guys would have just, it's a COVID-19 year, man. Shut it down. You know, but you got this foot, you're in the lineup, you're out of the lineup. And, and then we always hear about treatment. Like, so, so like how much is treatment? Like when you, when they say you got to go get treatment, like how much is that? Like, what does that involve when you got to go get treatment? Well, it, it, like I was doing iontophoresis. That's like basically where they put this patch on your own, whatever area you need to put it on. And they hook this, like this little machine thing up to it and it injects medicine into whatever injury and it helps heal faster. Or I could be icing. Could be in the cold tub, could be in the hot tub, could be doing the uh, chiro uh, therapies, um, or um, the Normatec boots like ice and stem, you know, no, ultrasound. Could be a number of things. It just depends on like what I feel like, or Mr. Ron feel like we need it. And how, so, how many days a week was that? Oh, that's season? every day. That's every day. That's every day. Like when? Like when do you find time for that? So. You know, we had a lot of time this year. You ain't had to go to class. You just had to get online. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So I would wake up in the morning, do a couple of assignments, and then go go to Butts and do my treatment and probably come back home, grab lunch while I'm there. And then um, after practice, I hit it again. So usually it happened. I did it like twice each day usually. That's impressive. You know, I don't think people realize when you talk about football players, you know, hey, they go to practice. And then they go to class. That's it, man. Like, you know, I don't, I don't think you understand like the commitment. And then you, and then on top of it, you add the treatment money, you know, has had little things And this treatment. I'm, I'm they ought to put your name in that room. I'm guessing. Cause you spent a lot of time trying to stay healthy, trying to play with your team. And, you know, so that's why when someone says something to me, I'm like, listen, money could have, if Monty didn't, if Monty didn't care, when that foot went bad against Alabama, he could have said, "I, I, I got to sit out till I'm, I'm honored." But no, you kept going every week, and I saw you going in and out, and I'm like, "Man, I, don't get me wrong, Quay Walker's coming, but there's something that ain't like that." Monty don't come out of games unless there's something going on, it, and that's where I got, you know, for you, it's got to be hard. Like, you don't want to come out, but is seventy percent of Monty better than a hundred? I mean, how do you make? That's got to be a, just a, a gut wrenching call every game to make. Do I am I do I stand? Am I just not there? 
How tough was that to manage? Well, at the end of the day, I'm about winning. So whatever we got to do to win. But, you know, yeah. I, I just I want to be on the field because that's what I came here to do is play, not watch. So, um, but, yeah, if if I'm hurt or Quay hurt and I got I can go in or he can go in for me like against Kentucky, he went like I wasn't playing. He started. He went down. I had to go in. Chana had to go in. So, you know, we all going to back each other up forever. That's just how it is. You know, our room, I feel like we got the tightest room because everybody, everybody support each other. Like, you know, if Channing doing like Channing lit, like Channing played probably played the less out of everybody, and other than Ryan and um Tresman, and he led the room in sacks, you know what I mean? So that just goes to how you know what I'm saying. Like we got talented players all over the linebacker room, and you know, whoever got the hot hand, that's who's gonna be in. Like if you win, you a starter no matter if your first time. Yeah, last time, like, if you ain't you a starter and you expect to play at a high level. Well, you guys, I think people are probably starting to get an idea why, why Monty was the leader. Uh, you know, why Dan Lanning said when Monty speaks, people listen. Because because Monty leads by example. And, you know, he's a guy that, that fought hard. He's, I know he was a Buckus Award finalist this year. Monty's modest. You know, but look, people know who he is and what he's been in the SEC and at the Georgia defense. Um, these last three years, he's been a heart of a defense that, that's in the top 10 every year. It, you know, that's had the number one re defense the last two years. I think Monty is a huge part of that, not just because of the tackles he makes and him being able to step into that 310 pound guy and take him on and then tackle a 230 pound running back like Najee Harris. But the, the, the thing that I'm so impressed with is how assignment sound Georgia football is. These guys, when that guy went through the middle on Cincinnati, I was like, I, I don't think I'd ever seen that happen. To, like, that doesn't happen to Georgia, the untouched runner. Like, that doesn't happen. Like, <laughs> I can't remember, Monty. I, I, I don't – in your career, I don't know if I've ever seen that happen. Can you think – I can't think of another guy that just – boom, somebody blew an assignment, he gone. I don't remember that. I can't remember. Rodney Anderson, um, Rose Bowl. That's the last time, like oh, – You got one. He, yeah, he, he had a good Three day. years. Yeah, he had a good day. That's the last one I can remember where I was like, dang, you know what I'm saying? Like, that was bad. <laughs> Other than that, really not. How do you – how do you – so when you're a vocal leader and you're, you're a tough guy, how do you – how do you motivate your teammates? Like, you know, it's not like you can grab a guy and throw him down on the ground and say, you miss another tackle, it's going to be worse now. How do you motivate – guys is there one money voice is it a little different with each guy because by the position you play by being the mic you're the automatic leader of that defense the mic has got to be the baddest dude on that d how did you lead man honestly you know i would be like i'm kind of like show by example like just because you don't want to disrespect nobody but if i had to like get on to somebody or be loud that wasn't no problem. It's just because everybody know, like, I come to work every day and I only want the best for them. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to steer them in the wrong way. You know what I'm saying? Or, do, or telling them to do something that I ain't doing. Like, that ain't never been me. So that's why people respect it because I'm practicing what I uh, what I'm preach. No doubt. Oh, I got my uh, volume on here. Sorry, my I'm turning off my phone. I'm looking at some of the comments. The fans are loving this, you know, because because Monty usually, the, yeah, the fan the fans love it because, and this is a little joke between me and Monty, but the but the truth of the matter is that for an athlete, they've got to be very aware of always representing the program, especially at Georgia. You know, Georgia athletes are great in interviews. They they they're very professional. Um, when they express emotion, you know, it's really from the heart. But like I told you, Monty can run hot, so. I, Sometimes people would ask a question and I would watch him and I'd go, oh, I don't know if they should have asked that. <laughs> and he would just kind of hold back. He would always be straight. He'd be like, he'd give you that look. I think we were at the arrival deal when all them players were missing in the Sugar Bowl. People started asking you all those questions. Didn't, he, didn't Kirby throw, didn't he throw you out there for that? I think you were out there. That was a tough, that was a tough spot. It was like, yeah, we're going to have Monty at the goal. Monty's got to be like, oh, man, really? How, what goes through your mind, and how do you manage that? Because being a Georgia Bulldog, being a team leader, it's almost like you're so careful to say the right thing. But at the same time, 
you're a very authentic guy. And, and I don't think you're ever going to say anything you don't mean. So sometimes your answer is just going to get cut a little short. And I'd be like, he had more to say, but he just chose not to say it. Yeah, for sure. You know, I try not to sugarcoat it because that ain't that ain't how I was brought up. My mama, and she don't do that. You know what I'm saying? My mama always been straight up. My family, that's kind of how my family is. So I get it from them. But, you know, I'm saying I ain't trying to embarrass the team or embarrass nobody else. So I'm always, you know, keep it like this and not get too high or too low. So, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of reporters, they ask questions they already know the answers to or they just be trying to fish or whatever. But she ain't no fishing over here. No, no, there's not. Monty don't play. Monty don't play that. But that's a, a takeoff from the in, li- in living color. Although we, we, we instead of homie don't play that, we say Monty don't play that because uh, sure. he doesn't play any games in those interviews. Um, I, I wanted to ask you. We were talking about rivalries the other day, and I remember a few years at Media Day, some Florida guys were talking about how they wish they could have played between the hedges because they were talking. They were going to get some of them hedges. They said. They, they see all these other teams come into Georgia and clip the edges. And they said they wish they could play in Sanford Stadium and get the hedges. Uh, what were your thoughts on Georgia, Florida? Some people say it's a neutral site game and going over the bridge. Where do you stand on that game and on whether home and home or playing down in Florida? What are your thoughts on that? Well, if you ask me, I think it's a home game for them every year because it's right down the street from where they go to school at. And we got to drive, what, five hours? It's a five-hour drive from Athens, so it really ain't fair as far as that. But, you know, 75% of the t- my time here, you know, we kind of took it over, and it was our it was our house. So, you know, we let them off the hook this year. But uh, kudos to them. But, yeah, I just think it'll be special for the rivalry to be home and home just because you'll be able to bring recruits. You can't bring recruits to the one in uh, Jacksonville. So I think it'll be, you know, I'm sure recruits, if you're coming to Georgia or Florida, you want to come. You want to go watch that game just because that's the biggest one. You know what I'm saying? It ain't many people walking around here that, you know, that's played in the Georgia-Florida game. So, you know, it's always a special moment, especially to win one or three of them we did. So, yeah, that's why I think it should go um, home and home just because, you know, like we were talking about, Alabama and Auburn home and home. I don't understand why we can't be, you know what I'm saying, home and home. So, I don't know, but it ain't up to me. Right. No, it's not. And, uh, you know, Coach Smart has his say and the administration has theirs and we'll see how that evolves. And, you know, I I watch Coach Smart and the intensity that he has and his players are intense. And I always wonder how that works, because we only get to see a little bit of practice, but we can hear practice from outside of those long walls. And you hear a lot of Kirby yelling and, and motivating. And when you're an intense guy and your coaches, like, how does, how does that work? How does Kirby, cause you guys are intense, man. How does he motivate? How does that work? What's that dynamic with coach smart when he's over the loudspeaker and you guys are hearing him? What do you, what makes him so effective? Do you think? Well, first of all, I say like, if you've ever been around him, you know, especially around like football with him, like, you can tell that he really loved the game, so you respect that because you don't want no coach who, like, he's just collecting the paycheck. You know what I'm saying? Because they get paid a lot of money to do this. And I'm here to tell y'all, Coach Smart ain't just collecting the paycheck. He, man, he worked work his ass off, excuse my language, but he worked hard on here. So, um, yeah, like, you know, he bring it every day. That's one dude who's going to bring it every day. I don't care if it's 130 degrees outside. Coach Smart is going to be out there yelling. He's going to be out there because at the end of the day, he not only want what's best for Georgia because that's his job, but he also want what's best for you and want to bring the best out of everybody because that's also how you keep a good culture. Like, that's one thing about if you're a recruit, like, I don't care what school you go to, but if you go to Georgia, you have no choice but to get better or you 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 can't hang because there's too many good players out there. Like, like, like even a walk-on, like, Lad McConkey, like I know y'all probably never heard of him, but Lad is gonna be a good player. But we have so many of them, you know. You, like most of y'all probably don't even know who Lad is, but that's just you know one, and we have a thousand of them. So that's just one thing about it. Like he does a good job of like recruiting players and evaluating talent, and you can you just see his passion for the game every day. The amount of time we spend in walkthroughs and meetings and practice, and um, you know, just getting ready for the games, and you know, we got walk through every day you got a long walk through Friday then you got another one before the game you know like an hour or two before the game or probably about two hours yeah about two hours before the game so coach Mark just always you know make sure you prepare in every way and you know coach Schumann you don't get enough credit coach Schumann always 
you know, he he kind of overboard with it, but you know, hell, I'd rather somebody be overboard with it than not prepare me at all. Like I can't like, you know, they just gonna always make sure you prepare for whatever you about to go against or whatever you about to see. Like I can't tell you I haven't seen every offensive formation ever. Shoe 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 make sure you guys know it. Like I've heard that said that he might be the smartest, one of the smartest coaches in football. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, it's, and that's part of what we see, though, when we were talking about those reads and that recognition, that over-preparedness. How did you guys shift? Because I, I think a lot of Mel Tucker. Mel's a guy that's, you know, certainly a veteran. Um, you know, he's been in the NFL. I know he's universally respected. But then in comes Coach Lanning. And to Coach Lanning's credit and to Coach Tucker's credit, because he prepared you guys, but the, it was a very seamless transition and, and Dan Lanning really seems to be Monty. And, and I know Georgia fans want to keep him forever, but this guy looks like he's going to be a head coach somewhere in the next few years and, and probably be a good one. What's coach Lanning like? Cause it looks like y'all love him too. Oh yeah. We rock with coach Lanning just cause he always out there, you know, coaching hard, just like coach Martin, you know, setting a good tone. But um, I would say like, you know, we, we got some dudes on our team, like, no matter who our coach is, we got some dudes on our team all across the board. Like, you can't tell me you had a room with DJ Daniel, Eric Stokes, Tyson Campbell, Mark Webb, Richard LeCount, Tyreek Stevenson. Like, you don't see many rooms like that. Like, all of those all of those are NFL guys. Like, Chris Smith, like, William Poole, Amir Speed, all have NFL ability, like, you know, those are guys that haven't played much, but, you know, they on their way just because we've been so stacked um, at Georgia. So I just think those guys don't get enough credit in, um, about what they do. But, you know, that. But you know the coaches do do a good job of putting us in position to make plays and be successful. And, you know, that's what they pay them to do. And they do a very good job of that. Of, you know, and then you look, you got Adam Anderson didn't play, like, that much and ended up with six sacks this year. You know, he plays like his hair's on fire. So if he if he makes those sacks, all those sacks against Auburn that he had, he, uh, he probably lead the team in sacks. Like, you got Nolan, you got yeah. uh, Robert Bill. You're like, you know, we loaded. Yeah, well, you made a great comment yesterday about Aziz, and I think it's true. I'd never thought about it. You said, what Aziz had? Nine sacks? Any other league, that's 18, right? Oh, yeah, the SEC, just go ahead and double it. Just go yeah, ahead just and double it. it. I, I want to ask you about and, – and it's irresistible. When you've got a big guy with a smile that's 340 pounds and can dance like Jordan Davis, I think everybody loves him. He looks like just a big teddy bear. You play behind Jordan. You could probably tell people the importance of it, you know, because he doesn't have a lot of sacks. He doesn't have a lot of tackles. But he might be one of the most important people on the field, right? Yeah, because, like, J.D. is obviously humongous. Like, it ain't, you know, you don't see many human beings that big. But to be honest, and I would say J.D., he put so much pressure on the center and then on the offensive line because they can't move him. And so that frees up me or frees up Channing or frees up Nicobe or Quay or Ryan or Tresman, whoever in the game, like it frees them up. Like when that center can't just climb up to you and Jordan Davis is raising hell up front. And that just goes to show and like Jordan Davis has like a switch. He can turn it on when he wants to and he can turn it off. But when he turned it on, somebody in trouble just because like <laughs> he just blessed, you know, God blessed him to be that big, that strong and athletic. Like and he's fast too. Like, you know, I've, I've seen him run 19 miles per hour. Like, he's fast. But, um, yeah, J.D. is a very – especially in our defense where, like, we need the D-line in order for the linebackers to flow. And they sacrifice a lot because if they went to a school like, uh, ain't you know, like Clemson or somewhere where, we, you know, they just let the D-linemen or, like, Notre Dame where they just let them, like, do whatever they want to do sometimes, like, oh, my God. Like, they be, you know, all Americans. But, you know, at Georgia, like, a D line, you I don't want to say you're you sacrifice. Well, you kind of sacrifice, you know, you definitely can't be selfish here and play D line, but you know, they still make their plays too. But you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to win. And you know, if you're good, it's gonna show anyways. Like, look at Jalen Carter, Devontae Smith, Trayvon Walker. Like, we all know they're good players, like, and people know like what's up, like, you know, ain't no hiding that. Like, so it is what it is when it comes to the defense. Like, again, you're gonna you're gonna still get developed if you come here at a high level, you're gonna go against the best every week, you know. For three years, I went against um, Solomon, Andrew, uh, Thomas, uh, Justin Schaefer, uh, Jamari, like Trey Hill, like all of them. Like, so, you know, it's not like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're getting better every day or 
you getting exposed. That's one. You either getting better, you getting exposed. So, yeah, that's, that's the truth. And, and you know, to Monty's point, when he's talking about guys that are being able to to maybe freelance a bit, that's where we get back to that gap integrity. Yeah, you could beat the guy with a speed move to the left, but we're counting on you plugging that gap there. You've got to be there. Somebody else is here. It's not a matter. I want to make the play. It's I got to play my assignment. And if we all play our assignment, that their wall's right there. But when guys start freelancing, and Monty knows it, because we saw one get called out. He's in Florida now. You start freelancing, it ain't going to happen. You lose contain. I don't care if you thought you could beat him. You just let that guy break contain, and now you let us down. Because if somebody's there, that play don't happen. So that's why Georgia's defense is so good because of what Monty's saying. The guys are bought into what's best for the team and what's best for the scheme. And, that, and that's not necessarily what's best for the individual, right? Some guys sure. just want to chase, you can't just chase the ball around, make plays. Right. you got to be like, all right, this is me, and build that wall, as they say. Everybody talks about it, Marnie, but you don't see many defenses do it with the discipline and commitment that the Georgia Bulldogs do. And that's because of guys like you in the middle that, one, first of all, you got to get them lined up right, right? Everybody's got to know what to do, but you got to get them lined up right. you got to be able to adjust. you got to make the right read. You got to do all that, and then everybody's got to also be able to play the – it's a lot. You know, it's, it's like Coach told me one time. On offense, somebody make a mistake, might not matter. It might be a backside guard, you know, might be a one-yard loss. Defense make a mistake, six Touchdown. points. Right? You got it. I mean, that's what it is. So, Jeff Centel would, would really be mad if I didn't ask you a recruiting question because there was a mystery of Monty Rice, right? I'm telling you, folks, you're getting a treat tonight because Monty – you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful he's doing the interview. I am because he's about football. He ain't about trying to be on a billboard or anything. He's a football player. And I think he just, he likes me just enough because I wore the same number. It was high school. I was a 32 in high school, but it, I, I'm using up my 32 equity with him at 32 and a 32 here. But Monty, tell the story, however you want to tell it, because we don't know what happened. Monty was Georgia and then Monty was LSU. And then Jeff said, and then he just showed up at Georgia. He said, can you find out what happened? I said, I'll ask him. So here we are. It was a long time ago. What happened? <laughs> uh, so, you know, I committed to LSU on my um, commitment day back at James Clemens High School. Um, but, you know, I thought LSU would have been a great fit. But, you know, I, honest, I'm being honest because, you know, I'm honest. I didn't think Coach O was going to be that good of a head coach, honestly. And either he proved me wrong or he had Joe Burrow. I don't I don't know. One of the two. <laughs> um, and that was kind of my main right. thing. And like I said, I had like such a connection with just like being a um a Bama fan growing up. I always loved a linebackers like um, Dante, Ruben, Reggie Ragland, like from 15 minutes from where I'm from. I'm from Huntsville, by the way. I want y'all to know that. I'm not from Madison. But um yeah, he just always did like, you know, Alabama has always had success with those linebackers and um, you know, they were coached by Coach Mar and Nick Saban and, and, you know, Kirby came to Georgia, so I thought it made sense. Now, obviously, those players are going to be good anywhere they went, but, you know, I just thought it made sense. Like, Coach Mar, them as they always known for ha having, like, a, a guy in the middle of the defense that's, you know, pretty good. Like, I can't, I can't really think of too many that didn't play on Sundays. Like, and that's the thing about Georgia, like, to all the recruits. I'm not recruiting you to Georgia, but what I'm saying is, just look at the numbers. Just look at the backers we got and look at the backers everywhere. You know, other schools got good linebackers, but they ain't got the ones we got. And every year you can say Georgia will put a linebacker in the league, whether they go Mr. Irrelevant, first or eighth pick. That's all I'm going to say. And we was all in one room together. Just this thing. we I was in a room with Nate Trez, Reggie Carter, Roquan Smith, um, Tate Crowder, um, who else? Juwan Taylor. and. Nate Trez, Roquan, and Tay, and now me about to be in the NFL. So, four guys from that uh, 2017 team. So, that's all I'm going to say. So, if you recruit, you want to play with the best and be the best, you come to Georgia because we just always put in that linebackers, you know. And, you know, other schools do a good job, but, you know, we're consistent every year. Number one in the nation and run defense the last two years, Monty. So, you've been training in uh, Pensacola. Yeah. Uh, eating even healthier than normal. You've always been a pretty healthy guy. I don't think you've ever come into camp overweight. Didn't look like it to me. Monty was always looked like he was ready. Yeah. 
Monty always looked like he was ready to get in the ring and, and, and go 15 rounds with somebody. He, he looked like he could have boxed too. I mean, you got that, you got that boxer build to you. Like, you know, I always wondered, did Monty box? Did you ever box? Was that ever in your background at all? Well, actually, I got, I got my, um, I got a friend named Bradley, Bradley Belt. Uh, he's from where I'm from. We play football together and for like conditioning and like training and just like overall health, we would, you know, box. And he, I, I'm not a boxer, but he is like, that's part of his craft, what he do. So he would always, whenever I go home and we get time, we hey, put on the gloves and we go and edit. And, uh, you know, we ain't trying to kill each other, but we just sparring maybe, or, you know, he just showing me what to do just in case I might have to, you know, real quick. <laughs> Just in case, you just never know, Monty. I'll tell you, man, I, I love it. So, so you said it earlier. Uh, you called it a million dollar job interview. You got pro day coming up on on. Uh, well, I guess what is it? Wednesday, the seventeenth. Is that Wednesday, or Thursday, Wednesday? So Wednesday. Some guys, some guys would just you know, and you know, it's just another day. You seem to like putting pressure on yourself. A million dollar job, Monty. The film is out. We know you can play. We know you're strong. We know you're fast. It's one, but you're saying a million dollar job. Is this? Are you getting in the game mode? Is that what this is? Are you locking in? Is that the? Is that why I'm feeling that intensity when you talk about pro day? For sure, yeah. Like I've been waiting on this moment since I was nine years old. Like I remember growing up watching Sunday Night Football, and I'm like, you know what? I'm a, I'm a. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna. I'm gonna play on Sundays one day. You know, now I got the opportunity to showcase in front of the whole NFL and the whole world. So it's always good to know, like hard work. Hard work does pay off, and you know, I've been working for this for a long time. And you know, through all the injuries, through all the doubt, through whatever, through it all, the adversity, all that, I prevailed. You know, through most of it. So. Um, that just goes, you got to be resilient and you got to be committed to it. You can ask anybody. I've been committed. I'm going to stay committed because I ain't, ain't no switching now what I've been doing because ain't no reason to do that because, you know, this, the way I am has got me to this point today. So that's why I'm, you know, I'm locked in for pro day because I'm treating it like it is, like I said, a million dollar job interview. It is. Most people don't get the opportunity to, to you know, if they run fast, they get this amount of money or, you know, obviously they know I can play football. I know I can play football, but, you know, it's always good to go showcase and put an exclamation on it. And you're feeling good because, as we said, the foot has been bothering you since the Alabama game. You had to get treatment every day through the entire season to get through the season, uh, help Georgia to another top 10 finish, another New Year's Six Bowl game. Uh, and then the Senior Bowl, you went down there. You still weren't – you You told me, I think you said you could have gone, but why chance it at that point? Really more about the interviews, but you feel like – you feel like you're ready to go. Everything else is feeling good right now. Yeah, the thing about the senior bowl is, like, it was still hurting, and I would have probably been out there, like, 70%, which, you know, scouts, you know, when they're out there, they're not out there to, like, you know, be my friend or, you know, make sure I'm all – you know what I'm saying? Like, all they're going to say is if they're looking at me and I'm out there limping, well, it doesn't look as fast as we thought. You know what I mean? Like, they're not about to still sorry for me, and that's not a knock against them. But, you know, I just got to look out for myself when it comes to that. You mentioned the film. One thing I saw this year, and I guess I would ask you how you improved it, the pass coverage. You know, a linebacker in today's game, man, it's, it's not fair. If you want to know the position getting hung out to dry by these RPOs, it's the linebacker. Because as Monty was talking about how he reads the line, these guys can come off the line like it's a run, and he's got to read run. First, first priority is stopping the run at Georgia, making the team one-dimensional. He's got to read the run first. And then all of a sudden, it ain't a run. And he's hung out a little bit now he's a step behind that the receiver tight end where his assignment is that RPO Monty but yet this year your pass coverage got so much better how how did you make that step forward step in that pass coverage because it's not just as simple as chasing somebody around I got you um so what I will say is you know whenever I give up a play it seems like they're like I can't cover but, you know, you see other people getting beat and, you know, they don't necessarily make an excuse for them, but they don't give them the same criticism as I get. And what I would just tell people humbly, just go watch the film, you know. And that Florida game this year, I'm, I'm sticking to Darius Tony at least 10 to 12 plays that game, one-on-one, -on -one, you know. Obviously, I might have safety help, but if I get beat across my face, you know, with how quick and fast he is, that's a touchdown. I mean, y'all see me running down the – 
um, field with Jalen Waddle. Uh, he ended up catching the ball, but you seen me step for step with him, or you seen me covering Devontae Smith. And I hurt my foot the Tuesday before the Alabama game. So my foot was already hurting the whole week. So, you know, I'm going to just let the film do the talking. You know, I, that's all I can do. Um, I've always been able to do whatever I've been asked to do at Georgia. You know, it's football. You're going to give us some plays, bro. I've been beat. Like Florida, that's why they did a good job of picking us with the receiver and running the wheel route. That's just good scheme by Mullen. You know, they did a good job. You know, that's just part of football. So, um, you know, you just got to be able to play through traffic or get over the top or, you know what I mean? So, it's nothing spectacular that, you know, they've done. You know, I've covered DeAndre Swift. I've covered James Cook in practice. You know, I've covered – you know, I covered them off. I had to run with me cold before in practice when we, when we almost set our defense. Um, so, you know, that's just part of the game nowadays. You got to be able to run. And, you know, Wednesday I'm about to, I'm about to, you know, showcase how fast I can run. I, I think that was – like I said, I think that was an area when I talked with Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl, one of the reasons why he selected you early was he saw that. He said Monty is, 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 is good in pass coverage. They were very impressed. And you're right. You know, it's like the it's like the umpire. You only notice him when he miss, you know, or an offensive lineman when I had Ben Cleveland on. You know, you watch the whole football game, an offensive lineman gets beat once out of 72 plays. You go, oh, look at that, man. That guy stinks. He gave up one set. Man, it's gonna happen. You gotta battle every play. And the guys that you're battling, like you said, Kadarius Tony, man, that that guy's sick, man. He's gonna be doing some fantasy football numbers pretty soon, Monty. I'm gonna tell you, I was impressed with Kadarius Tony, uh, how electric he was in the field. Didn't drop no balls, became a better route runner. Like you, every game, every game, you're going up against an NFL guy. So I, I don't, I never sensed anybody down on you, but I, I do sense one thing, and I think you all sense it about Monty. Monty Rice is his own toughest critic, folks. I'll take it right back to the beginning of the show. Bo Nick slips in for a touchdown. They beat Auburn, but Monty is upset about that one play he's not going to give himself a break and that is what makes Monty Rice special and as I've told him before that's why Kirby Smart keeps sending this guy out for interviews he said <laughs> listen to, he keeps sending him out there Monty I think Monty had to look like why does he keep sending me out of here because he knows what you're going to say man he knows sure. what you're say. so I think I know the Georgia fans are excited Monty I've helped you I've held you a lot longer than I intended to but I do enjoy interviewing you uh, you've been one of my favorite players to cover at Jordan, not just the 32, but the intensity that you play with and that the leadership. And, and, and one of my concerns for Georgia next season, and I know there's a lot of predictions being made because of that offense. Um, one of my concerns is who's going to lead the defense because Monty's gone. Monty's out of the middle. Who are some of the guys that we might look forward to that will try to fill those shoes? Um, well, you know, as a linebacker, you know, you, you got to be able to be vocal and, you know, you, like you can't be, you can't have a knucklehead at inside linebacker here and, you know, expect them to lead, like, you know, just with the responsibility that is placed upon you playing inside linebacker here. So, you know, we got a number of guys that can come in and do things the right way and make it and show the other players, you know, we got a young team coming up. So I think it would be very important, which I know is being done now, like Quay, Shannon, Nakobe, Ryan Davis, Tresman, all those guys, are, you know, they're, they're, in, they're entering their third and fourth year. So, and a lot of those guys have experience, you know, whether it's a little bit, whether it's like Channing came in at the end of games last year and went nuts. Like, you know, you saw it against Tennessee, two sacks on one drive. He ended up with like four or five, six tackles on, you know, throughout the game, you know. So he, so, you know, those are guys that can come in and affect people with how they play and how they talk and how they carry themselves. And as you can see, Kobe carries himself well. Quay carries himself well. Channing carries himself well. All those guys carry themselves well, and I think that'll rub off on the DBs. And then you got Lewis in the secondary. He don't say much, but when he do speak, you know, people going to respect it because, again, he carry himself the right way and he do the right things on and off the field. Another person, Chris Smith, he does the right thing. You know, he's you know, he he's been – he's been he's had his head down since he's been here. He's been behind Rich, and, you know, he's always stayed the course and never – wandered off or transferred, he's waited his turn. And, you know, I think, it, you know, other people see that kind of stuff and he kind of rubs off on them, you know. And it's always better when, coach, like, you know, a player is able to affect another player rather than Coach Smart yelling at him or trying to talk to him. You know what I'm saying? It's different when um, 
it comes from a player. Like, that's why JR was so important. Like, JR was a guy who did everything right on and off the field, live right. And, you know, he, you know, if like, if I ever needed help or Dom Sanders, I'm thinking all the way back to Dom Sanders, like my freshman year against Mizzou, I ain't, I ain't have a, uh, I ain't have a clue what, what I was supposed to do because I moved to a new position because of some injuries. And I got to start that game. And I look back at him every day, hey, Dom, what I got? He's like, hey, Monty, play this, play this, play this, play that. And he was always making sure I'm scraped. So, you know, as long as the guys in the in- inside linebacker room and even in the outside linebacker room, you know, you got Robert Bill, Adam, Nolan, you got all those guys in there that will be able to make an impact on guys. It's just up to them how they want to do it. You know, they could go about it whatever way, vote or, you know, by example, that's up to them. But as long as they try to affect other people, you know, Georgia will be fine on defense. Because it ain't a talent issue. Huh? It ain't a talent issue at all. It's not a talent. Is there a surprise player that we should watch for? Is there there a guy right now, if you buy stock, who would you buy stock in for this year? Who would I buy stock in, man? I'm going to buy stock in Trayvon Walk. Actually, I'm going to buy stock in the whole defense. I knew you were going there. But if I I knew you were going there. But if I had to, you know, throw a little extra to whoever, I'd go Trayvon Walker in the whole inside linebacker room. Because, you know, people like the, the – you got people – you know, I can say this now because, I'm, you know, I ain't on play for Georgia right now. So – but you got other people around the SEC thinking they got better linebackers than us. And, again, I would just say, who have they put in the draft and who have we put in the draft? Just check the number, check the stats, check the tape. That's all I'm gonna say. It ain't no comparison at all. So if you're a recruit, if you on here, go to Georgia. I'm back to that. And but um, no, nah, those guys do a good job. And you know, other I'm not saying other teams don't have good players. They do, but they just don't have the guys we got. And you know, I think that speaks for itself. Mine's gonna be wearing a Georgia Bulldog jersey underneath them shorter pants. Whatever NFL team he's got, he's gonna have some Georgia on underneath. Like now, give me some offense before I let you go. A lot of people are excited about this offense. Uh. George Pickens is a guy from your home state. I, yeah. I would love to see a conversation between Monty Rice and George. I'd be a fly on the wall for that one because that guy is super. That guy's got some talent. Who are some other guys? Give me, give me your George Pickens story, and then give me some guys on offense we need to look for. Man, George is – George is George, man. Like, you know, he get a lot of, like, hate from his little antics, but I'm telling you all, George don't mean no harm at all. He just be having fun. And the thing, I mean, I know squirting water bottle in the middle of the game on somebody, and if we get a 15 yard penalty, that's not funny. But George don't mean no harm by, and I know it cost us at the time, but like nobody works harder than George Pickens at practice. And you can ask anybody on the whole team to back that up. I don't care who it is from walk on to the first person on scholarship. You can ask him. George Pickens, like that catch I've seen in the um, Peach Bowl, him diving, he do that in practice, like for, like just out of him having fun with the game. And, and that's why I respect George so much. Sure, he needs to, like, fix some stuff he does. But as long as he, you know, keeps his head on straight, which he will because he ain't no bad kid. Like, you know, like, he gets a lot of criticism for the stuff he does. He ain't got in the fight at Georgia Tech, you know, blah, 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 you know. He's moved past that, though, you know, and he will continue to do that. And it's not like he's immature again. I just He just needs to pick better times to have his fun, you know what I mean? So, you know, if George is my son or, you know, my brother or whatever, which he is, but, like, if he was my son, I would just tell him, you know, hey, there's a lot of things you could be out here doing that other 18 through 22-year-old kids are doing. If the worst thing he's doing is squirting water on somebody, I'll take it. Because yeah. there's a lot of 18 to 22-year-old kids out here doing, y'all know what, we in college, y'all know what's up. So that's what I'm saying. So don't give him too much criticism. Y'all got to love on him because he ain't no bad kid. And you obviously he's a hell of a football player. But, you know, in that running back room, we loaded like from top to bottom, but I think, uh, you know, obviously James and Zamir and Kenny, you know, those guys and, and Kendall, but a guy slept on Dejan Edwards. Really? Yeah, and y'all don't get to see him because he hadn't got the ball that much, but just just pay attention. He's, he's a little guy, but just watch Dejan when, he, when the ball's in his hand. Just watch him. Just watch him. Just watch him. That's all I'm going to say. And obviously, you know, Jermaine Burden and Kiaris and all them going to show up. And the tight ends, Fitzpatrick, you know, I'm, uh, Brett Seether, I'm looking for him to show up this year. I'm pretty sure he will as long as he, you know, keep his head on straight, keep working hard in practice. He's a great kid, all of them. But, yeah, Dejan Edwards, that's probably my dark horse. He don't get enough respect, but you guys don't get to see right. what we see in practice. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of how Matt Landers was. Like, 
Matt probably go for 200 yards in practice, three touchdowns would be keeping stats. You know, it just didn't always go to the game, and that's kind of due to how our offense was set up. Matt didn't, you know, he got some targets, but he didn't get, you know, probably, you know, the targets that we thought he should have had or whatever, but, you know, I'm not coach. But, yeah, Dejan Edwards, you know, he's the guy that, you know, I think will, you know, he, he, he'll he be like, I think he can be like Swift was as a freshman, you know what I mean, where people, like, hell, I didn't know Swift was about to play that much, and, I didn't know how good he was, but there was just one run in practice in fall camp. I seen DeAndre Swift get the ball. He he, he juke, spent, ran over the safety, and kept going. And I was just like, <laughs> all right. You know, I, that's when he had my respect. That was in the middle of fall camp our freshman year. When, so when I, did, I think um, – you said when, what? When did, when, did, when did JT Daniels – uh, impressed Monty because he's this California guy coming in with the funny mustache and who is this guy right when did you know like this this guy might be all right um to be honest I didn't know because you know you know you had Jamie but Jamie left and Jamie is a bulldog by the way yeah yeah let's let's follow up on that Monty because a lot of Georgia fans say well Jamie Newman came but he didn't play in the games and and you were like you were insistent and you're le- you're a team leader you guys that play on the team decide who's a part of that fraternity of Georgia Bulldog. You claim sure. Jamie Newman. You made that very clear. Explain why. Just because, I mean, Jamie, you know, he signed his, you know, scholarship to come here, um, grad transferring from Wake Forest. And he came here, he, he bled with us, he sweated with us. You know, he put in work just like we did. And he just wasn't able to make it to the season due to COVID and due to the other reasons he had going on. And, you know, he also – probably made a probably a business decision too. So, you know, you can't fault him for doing what's best for him. And cause you know, nobody's fault, you know, anybody else for doing what's best for their career and, you know, for them in the long run. So you can't fault him for that. You got to look, you know, we still young, you know, we got this person over here talking, we got y'all talking, we got to listen to these people. You know, there's a thousand things people is trying to talk to us about. So I just think is sometimes go easy, bro. Cause y'all don't always know what's going on. Don't just jump on people and, you know, but, you know, that's just kind of what fans do anyways. But, yeah, Jamie Newman forever accepted. He forever good over here, you know, this way, just because I know what he about. You know, he, he worked hard with us. You know, he did what he was supposed to do. He just wasn't, you know, fortunate enough to make it to the season. You know what I mean? So, you know, it, yeah. everything happens for a reason. That's all God's um, timing and God's plan. You know what I mean? You can't – everything happens for a reason. Like, you, you can't just – you can't question what God got, you know, in store. You mentioned JT. You said you really didn't know at first. You really didn't have a, a quick read that JT Daniels. What do you see in his crystal ball? I heard Eric Zier compared him a little bit to Jake Fromm. What do you see when you see JT Daniels at quarterback, Monty? You, you played against some great ones, and you've seen him lead your team at the last four games of the season. Uh, JT Daniels, um, when he came in, you know, he had the mustache. I had heard of him before because he was like, you know, highly touted behind uh, Trevor and Justin Fields that year, right? Yeah, he, was, he was like number three quarterback. So I had heard of him before, but, you know, he, he gained my respect when, you know, um, not even in practice because he was kind of on the scout team. But one thing about it, the whole year he was like on the scout team, he always gave us a good look. I will say that, like, it wasn't no complaining. Like, I'm on the scout team. I'm this five-star from California. Like, he came in you know, stayed down and did what he was supposed to do, and he got his shot. Um, and, and and when he did come in, he – y'all saw against Mississippi State. Um, he threw some – you know, I haven't seen Georgia throw bombs like that since I've been here, really. You know what I mean? Like, and it was bomb, it was bombs away when he came in, and it was bombs away the next week, now bombs away the next week. So I just think it's important for JT to keep getting better, which he will because he's not like a – selfish person like he's always trying to get better too but he's he's kind of quiet guy and you know he has some scrambling ability too y'all haven't seen so um I think it's important for him to keep getting better because you know Georgia will go as far as he goes you know so he's kind of like the the guy now so you know and I think he will I know he will especially with those receivers he got around him and those backs you know Georgia like I said play running back or linebacker come to Georgia we got them all I was going to so, say, Monty, you're leaving just in time. I think the offense is going to start winning these ba- these practice battles. Now, my producer is is begging me to ask you one more question. They, oh. they can't get enough. He wants to know about Darnell Washington and Arian Smith. 
He want to know what your read is on those young guys. Well, first of all, Arian is the fastest thing at Georgia. I don't know who faster. Like, I don't know. Like, he, he probably going to run faster than Stokes when it's time. Stokes said it. Stokes told us that. Stokes, if Stokes even says it, because you know yeah. for a fast guy to say it, he's got to be fast if Stokes Oh, yeah. That. Arian is, is, is ridiculously fast. And Darnell is humongous, obviously. And it's important for Dar- – obviously, Darnell is a matchup nightmare for anybody just because his size and, you know, he's able to create space. And, you know, people on offense give that little push off anyways. So um, – but as long as Darnell continues to, you know, develop and, you know, get stronger in the weight room, which he was like – he was like 270 last year and didn't even look like he's just so big. But – um, as long as he keeps getting better, keep developing, keep getting, you know, because a lot of it's here now, you know. Everybody's talented, but it's about what's in here and how can you process things. And as long as he keeps the, you know, processing things like he has and Georgia finds creative ways to get people like him, James Cook, especially James Cook. James Cook got to touch the ball. Like, he's just one of those guys where, like, you know, he only need about eight to ten carries and one of them might go for 80, you know, with James. So, that's the thing with him. We just got to find creative ways to get these guys the ball and in space or, you know, by make, even making them decoys to get somebody else open. You know what I mean? Like, kind of like how, like, other teams do. Like, you know, like Alabama and Florida, you know, they find ways to get those guys the ball and get them open. And, you know, and I think Georgia will, you know, be able to do that. I think they seen, like, you know, how we were able to, like, throw the ball last year when we needed to against Mississippi State because we weren't running it that night. They, we were definitely throwing it. So um, I think it's important because, you know, obviously we're going to always have a run game, but if we're able to throw it over people's heads to George Pickens and Kieris and Aaron, because Aaron going to take the top off because can't nobody run with him. And the only person that can run with him is Keeley and Keeley on our team. So that's good. So <laughs> as long as they keep, you know, throwing the ball and throwing the ball and creating explosives, we'll, we'll be just fine. Two observations I've had tonight, and I think people watching know it. The way Monty talks about his teammates, okay, talk, he's much more comfortable talking about his teammates than he is talking about himself. He could go on and on about his teammates. If I ask him about himself, he gets real quiet, doesn't say a whole lot. And two, Monty, I, I know that I know the NFL is next, but is there a coaching job in your future? Because you sound a lot like a football coach when you're talking, man. Yeah, just because not that school ain't important, kids. Y'all stay in school. I'm not saying that. But playing football has taught me more than any professor, any teacher. Not that the teacher or professor did a bad job, just because, to be honest, bro, um, college is, is great and all. You, you know, you get a good education, especially here at Georgia. But, you know, football just teaches you how to deal with people you might not like or how to deal, how to, you know, battle through adversity, whether that's in the weight room or on the field, you know, because at linebacker and, and football in general, you got to solve problems. This guy keeps blitzing off the edge, sacking us we got to find a way to not let them sack us no more. You know what I mean? So, and, and that, that's bad. That, in my opinion, just like the stuff that I, I've had to deal with when it comes to football has taught me way more how to live my own life outside of football and off the field. And you know, I just think that goes to show like the, the program that I was in in high school and the program that I was in in college, like, you know, they put you in those tough situations to see how you're going to respond. And I think that's the same thing with, with life. So, and, you know, and in school, always, we don't always learn, like, you know, this baking class, you know, that's not going to help much. You know what I mean? You know, right. that's up to you to take that baking class. But, you know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes in school, like, you – you like, some of the stuff is, like, unrealistic. You're not going to use it at all. You know what I mean? It's, it's cool. Life skills, the ability to communicate, the ability to function in environment, the ability to team lead, the ability yes. to get the most of the people around you. Absolutely. Yeah, and, that's, and that's what football is, like. You know, football, is, in my opinion, is just like running a business. You got to make sure this guy's good because if that guy is not doing his job, the business might go under. And that's just a small example. But you got to make sure everything's good because if everything's not good, then you make no money. And football the same way. You don't make tackles or you don't make plays or, you know, you don't score touchdowns. You lose. It doesn't work. You know, got a for sale sign in Coach Hughes' yard. We don't want that. Right. Right. You got to be assignment sound. That's what it's all about. Monty, I can't, again, I can't thank you enough, man. I really didn't intend on keeping this long, but it's uh, been so good, much fun. Good. I appreciate it. I wish, I can't wait to, I'm going to try and hit you up after your pro day. Let's talk about what you did. 
I know you're ready, man. You're keyed up. And uh, I'm, I'm going to miss seeing that 32 out there, man. I'm going to – I see that number. I can't help it. I'm just like, he's going to do something because uh, 32 does that. I hope they – I hope there's a way. Is there any way you can get 32 in the NFL or they just don't let linebackers get that? I don't think you can. I wish I could. I would keep it the same. Oh, man. All right. Well, we're going to see another number from Monty Rice in the NFL. We'll look for his numbers this week at Pro Day. Monty, thanks for joining us. Hey, folks, let's take a break. I want to thank our sponsor, Ingles. If you'll stick with me just a moment, we're going to play this commercial. When I come back, I'll take your questions, and we'll close out tonight's Ingles on the beat. Now, a moment with our sponsor, Ingles. It's in our hearts to feel for real. There's been ups and downs, turnarounds, there's good days and some bad. But we stand together for worse and for better. We'll always have your back. Welcome back to the program. Mike Griffith here. I can't help it. I, I told Monty 20 minutes. I told him 20 minutes, folks. He went an hour. You got an, I, I, I can almost promise you you're never going to see another hour interview with Monty Rice. Monty was engaged, and Monty loves Georgia. And all we did was talk football. And, and that's what these guys are. I don't know. You know, when you see the snippets, they play like one clip of something a guy says after a game. Or maybe you watch the video and you see us ask questions for six minutes and this guy asks a question and this guy asks a question and this guy, and, and it's just, you know, somebody might, ask, Hey Monty, what do you think about black jerseys? Hey Monty, what about last week's game? Hey Monty, what about the, you know, and you don't really get a conversation and it's really hard to get a feel for who these players are, the way things are. And, I, and it's not anybody's fault. Georgia does as good a job as anybody, but, you just don't get those kind of interviews. And I, I really hope that Georgia fans got a feel for what was under that helmet and what was under that number 32 number tonight. Because I don't – Monty's not a guy that, that runs in front of cameras and wants to be the star guy. He just wants to play football and he wants to lead. And you heard that in his interview tonight. Monty loves his guys. And I felt so good listening to Monty talk about – the Georgia Bulldogs and, and his teammates. I thought that was awesome. And um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you got, you got some insight into Monty talking about different players he went up against. Uh, you got some insight into some players on the rise. I can't thank Monty enough. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to look right now and see if you got any questions before we go here, folks. Uh, you guys don't like my hat. This is just an Oconee River hat. It's, a, it's from River Rafting. It's not a it's not a team hat. It's not a everybody's like, why doesn't Mike wear Georgia gear? Well, I'm a reporter. I'm a reporter. I wear Dog Nation gear. I'm on my team and we cover Georgia. And I've told you this guys before. I've told you guys this before. When you're a reporter, you don't root for teams, but you do root for certain people. You want to see the good guys do well. When you make when you make a, a build a relationship with a player, when you admire what he's been through when you know how hard he plays, you want to see that guy do well. That's real life. Teams come and go. Wins, losses, obviously it's better. Dog Nation fans are much happier when Georgia wins. That's good for the program, right? But who I root for or who I don't root for, it doesn't make a difference in the final score. But I've got to be objective and I've got to watch the game carefully. If I get wrapped up emotionally in a game, I'm going to have a hard time providing analysis. And I've got to be objective. Hey, there's games, and Monty knows it. I'd say 90% of the time I do that report card, Monty Rice is one of the best players. But there, there be, might be a game where I say, well, Monty missed this. And then there might be a game I say, Monty missed this, and then I find out later, really, it wasn't Monty. Maybe it was somebody else's assignment. That's really hard not knowing whose assignment was what. You heard the complexity, Monty talking earlier, of all the different calls, which way they're moving the front, what that means to the defense behind him. He didn't even talk about who might be stunning or blitzing and leaving their responsibility, and therefore somebody else has to slide in their position. The zone blitz concept, right? You know what I'm talking about? The linebacker blitzes, and the defensive end drops back into the coverage of the guy that the linebacker. Well, if you don't know that's a zone blitz, you might be really confused. But there's And Kirby is the best at providing a house of mirrors. 
You know, Monty talk, talked about how Gus Malzahn does that with offense. Kirby does that with defense. Georgia is complex. They are hard to solve, and they've got a dynamic defensive front this year. They're going to be very, very exciting. Someone's saying, oh, they think I root for Tennessee. I don't, you know, I'm not sure what that means. I, you know, uh, listen, you look at my background, and I don't mind sharing this with you. Uh, I grew up watching SEC football, all right? I was born in Mobile, Alabama. South Alabama's there. It's four hours from Tuscaloosa. It's four hours from Auburn. It's four hours from Florida State. It's three and a half hours from LSU. There's no team in Mobile, Alabama. But what there was for me after I moved to Michigan, where I grew up, was SEC football and television. And I didn't care who it was. I loved listening to Keith Jackson. And I loved watching SEC games because the cheers, the passion, and you you could just tell it meant a lot. So when I became a sports writer, my goal was to cover SEC football. And I didn't know where I would go. My first break, the first job I got, was covering Auburn. And I covered Auburn in 93 and 94. At Terry Bowden, it was awesome. They were great. I saw him beat Spurrier twice in a row. I'm like, wow, Terry Bowden out coached Steve Spurrier. 93 and 94, he beat him. His first two years as a head coach, he beat Steve Spurrier. Nobody else was doing it back then. Well, I guess Gene Stalling. But then I go from Auburn to Alabama. And, and you guys know I, I, I got close with Coach Stallings and his staff. I'm, I, I still check on Coach Stallings. He means a lot to me. Uh, coach Stallings is, is, is best friends with Ray Goff. Coach, did you know that Ron Corson, the great Ron Corson that Georgia has, the longtime trainer, that was a gift from Coach Stallings. He recommended him to Ray Goff, but I was covering Bama. So I got to know Dabo Sweeney really well there and Woody McCorvey, those two Clemson guys now, but back then they were Alabama guys. So I was at Bama for four years. And then they said, hey, instead of you driving from Mobile to Tuscaloosa, why don't you come up here and work in Knoxville? You can live in the same town as the team you cover. So I covered the Tennessee Vols and I did uh, Philip Fulmer and then Bruce Pearl got hired and they said, we want this to be your primary beat. You'll still do some football and do some TV on it, but you want you to follow Bruce Pearl and Bruce Pearl basketball. I said, all right, that was the most fun beat I ever had because every practice was wide open. He's a blast. Bruce Pearl's hilarious. And in the meantime, I'm doing NASCAR in the summer. I'm going to 12 or 15 races, Uh, London Olympics, uh, three weeks over in London. Incredible. And then I go to Michigan, Digital World, cover Michigan State. It's where I went to college. Four years with Tom Izzo, four years with Mark D'Antonio. Great. And then my producer, Michael Carvel, recruits me down to Atlanta. And, and he says, hey, we need a Tennessee guy. So I do Tennessee a couple more years. And, uh, and then Georgia comes open. And here I am, man, getting ready for season four. So I've done Auburn. I've done Alabama. I've done Tennessee. I've done Georgia. I've done Michigan State. Before I went to Auburn, I covered Idaho State. So you tell me who my favorite team is because I'm confused. I'll tell you, the only team I cheer for was my kids' team or when I coached travel softball. That's when I would cheer, right? But right now, I'm just observing. So I hope that solves the answer for all of you. You won't see me wearing team gear for anybody. I don't wear it. I don't have an Alabama hat, an Auburn hat, Tennessee hat, Georgia hat purposely. It just, it doesn't work for me in, in series, like sounding off on me. So that's the deal. I, I don't know, you know, people are always like, well, who does he like? I, I, I like sports, man. I like sports and I talk to you guys straight. And, uh, and that's the truth. So uh, that's just the truth. That's just how it's been. And I enjoyed every beat I was on and they've all got something special. But right now, Georgia, Kirby Smart, what's happening, Sanford Stadium, game day, man. It, it's, it's an incredible setting. I'm in the place where I'm supposed to be right now covering a program that is on the verge and it's exciting to cover a program on the verge. And, uh, it's, I, I, I think this could be the year myself. So, uh, that's that. Um, I, I, I don't see really any questions here. Uh, listen, I want to thank you for watching. Congratulations, by the way, to coach Joni Taylor, uh, UGA women's basketball team with a number three seed. They'll start out with Drexel. Uh, we had coach Taylor on I strongly, 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 suggest you watch the show I did with coach Taylor last Friday. She talks about her career and who she is and where she is. I promise you, you will be motivated by it. She is a very, very impressive coach on the verge, on the verge. So if you're a Georgia fan, there's a lot to look forward to. I want to thank you again for joining me tomorrow. Brandon Adams, Dog Nation Daily every day at 10, 10, 15, he gets it started. Tomorrow night, Connor coverage, Connor Riley does his show. 
Wednesday night. It's Jeff Santel before the hedges. This week, we will have a cover four show on Thursday night. So everyone, Georgia Spring football starts tomorrow. It's on. And uh, Wednesday, we'll be pulling for Monty and Eric Stokes and Ben Cleveland and all the guys at the Georgia Pro Day. Thanks for watching the show tonight, everybody. Have a great week.